What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Married at First Sight, Season 15, Episode 5. Now, let's get into Stasha and Nate. Now, the last time that we saw Stasha and Nate, things were getting really hot and heavy in that shower scene. The electricity between them, the attraction between them, they were so, like, drawn to each other. The chemistry was so strong between them that my television was melting. It was so, so heated in that shower scene scene but nothing happened they did not consummate their marriage so they tell us and we have to believe what they say right so they say they did not consummate their marriage Stasha tells us that she was waiting for more of an emotional or a mental connection with Nate and that she didn't want to be led by just physical attraction or just be led by what her body was telling her she wants to wait until they have more of a stronger foundation before she decides to take that route with Nate so then later on they go four-wheeling and Stasha tells us that this is going to be an opportunity for her to see if Nate is that kind of guy that's always concerned about his woman, making sure that she's okay, making sure that she knows how to ride the four-wheeler. But the time when she was getting ready to get on the four-wheeler, she didn't know how to put on her helmet, her goggles or whatever. So instead of Nate showing her, because he had his equipment on, instead of Nate showing her exactly how to do it and, you know, whatever, he was busy with his phone the whole entire time recording himself for his social media so the instructor that was there had to tell her what to do and how to do it so then they go off four wheeling and you know she's a little bit unsure of herself on this um vehicle but nate he was gone. He had left her in the dust. He was out of there. He didn't, he didn't even look back once to see that she was following him. He didn't look back once to see if she was okay. She could have fallen off a cliff and Nate would not have known. So as he's riding his four wheeler the whole entire time, he's actually looking at himself. He's recording himself on his phone. He's more concerned about posting on his social media about this experience than actually sharing this experience with his wife. So later on, she decides to have a conversation with him and she tells him that she wants him to be like a little bit more involved, a little bit more, you know, acting more like someone who has a partner and not like a single guy. And he said that, you know, he can't just flip the switch. He's still trying to get acclimated to this whole situation, get used to the idea that he does have a partner now that he is in a marriage. So it's going to take him time and basically she just needs to be patient. He's trying to figure it all out. Later on, they have dinner. When they had dinner, Stasha tells him that her mother informed her that um, Nate had told her mother that he had been in bankruptcy. His business had been in bankruptcy. And I thought that was a perfect segue to get into the discussion about the post nut because here she is talking about his financial woes, how his business failed. He had to go through bankruptcy. So evidently something wasn't quite right with his financials. And so it would it made perfect sense for her to bring up the post nut and to basically act like, you know what, um, you had some mis you had some misfortunes in your finances, so I kind of need to protect myself. So what about a post nup? So I thought that was a perfect segue because if she had just brought up the post nup out of the blue, um, it might have turned him off a little bit. But the fact that she mentioned the bankruptcy and then she talked about the post nup, it kind of made sense. So Nate kind of was a little bit taken aback about it. He was like, Oh, so you don't really trust your boy? And she was like, No, it's just that I need to protect my my finances and blah 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 she gives her explanation her whole spiel about why she should do a post nup he's like you know what if it makes you comfortable if that's what you want to do I have no problem with it so he tells her I'm cool with the post nup but then later on in the confessional he said that he kind of felt hurt that she had wanted a post nup so I'm wondering if this is going to fester in the back of his mind and that he's going to bring up later in an argument or something that you know there's no trust you know how can he trust her if she if she can't trust him and I hope that he doesn't do that you know because marriages to me are like 70% business, 30% romance. You need to make sure that things are all in the up and up with all, because there is a business aspect to marriage. So there's finances, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with marriages. And so um, I hope he doesn't use it against her. I don't want him to say, oh yeah, it's okay. It's cool. If it makes you happy, I'll do it. And then later on, he's actually resentful that he did it or that she would bring it up. So he's okay with that. And then she talks about children. She says that she wants to have children within a year. And he was like, you mean like in 365 days? Yeah, that would make about a year, Nate. So 
He says, well, I was kind of thinking we would wait like two or three years, you know, a year seems kind of, you know, uh, and I do agree. You don't, I don't think they should be having kids in a year, but then on the other hand, you know, she is past the age of 35, even though, you know, I don't see anything wrong with women having children, you know, in their late thirties, mid forties, late forties. I don't see anything wrong with that. So I think she still does have a little bit more time. I don't think they have to really do it in a year, but I understand her concern because number one, you don't even know if you can conceive easily. There might be some issues there. And so there's already going to be time wasted trying to figure out, you know, can we even have a baby naturally? Do we have to go through fertility treatments? And so a lot of time is eaten up, you know, trying to like discover what you can and cannot do. So in a way it does make sense, but I also see his side, like he just wants to enjoy marriage, enjoy his wife before you bring children into the picture. Let's move on to Lindy and Miguel. So, um, Miguel, the more and more I see Miguel, the more I'm like, mm, Miguel, he is, um, yeah, I think he's kind of nice to look at, to tell you the truth. He's, um, he's some eye candy for this season, because I think out of all the husbands, him and Nate are probably the best looking. And I think that Miguel is even more good looking than Nate. So I think he's like a perfect catch as far as the fact that, you know, he's attractive, he's educated, he's intellectual. I, I'm kind of a fan of Miguel so far. Okay, so far, he hasn't pissed me off. So they're having breakfast and he's just in his shorts, no shirt, no nothing, just in his shorts. And um, Lindy is talking, talking, talking like she normally does. And I, I don't even know what she was saying because I was like so razor focused on Miguel and the. And it was nice. So... Lindy tells Miguel that she was engaged before at the age of 23 and that she had lost her virginity to her fiance. So even though she has a very strict upbringing, a very strict religious upbringing, um, I think Lindy was like um, testing her boundaries, her religious boundaries, trying to find herself, I guess, trying to figure out whether she's really in this religious religion as deep as she should be or not. you know she's just trying to discover who she is and so I kind of felt like she shouldn't have told Miguel th that she had you know um was intimate with her fiance before they got married because now he's going to be thinking well if you would do it with him and you weren't even married yet, then what's the excuse of not doing it with me? And we are married and we are husband and wife because Miguel wants him some Lindy. Um, so I kind of, I'm wondering if he's going to use that against her, you know, that information against her for him to get what he wants at the end, if you know what I mean. So Miguel was telling her that within about three months, he can kind of, that's how long it takes for him to decide whether, on, whether or not he is serious or he's going to be serious with his partner. And Lindy, I guess this whole um, episode, she was sort of like concerned with the fact that Miguel is, she doesn't believe that Miguel is really in this for the long haul. You know, she kind of questions how committed he is to this whole entire process because to Lindy, love is a choice. You make the decision to love someone, you make the decision to be committed to someone. And once you make that decision, you just have to follow it through. Whereas with Miguel, love is a feeling. And so he has to wait for that feeling to come when he, uh, before he makes a decision of whether or not he's going to be committed to someone. So with Miguel, he's on the fence, he's if he doesn't know if he's um, in this for the long haul or for the short haul. He doesn't know. Whereas Lindy has already made up her mind that no, no matter what, she's going to stay married to him. So then they have dinner together later on in the evening and they talk about their backgrounds. And Miguel says that uh, for a period of time, his family had moved to the Dominican Republic. And he said that even though he could pass off as a Latin person or Hispanic person, he didn't speak Spanish. And so people would look at him and automatically assume that he spoke Spanish, but he didn't. And he said that he kind of suffered a cultural identity, uh, had some type of a identity crisis. That's what he said. He, he suffered an identity crisis, which made him kind of like draw within himself more and spend more time by himself and away from other people. And so that's when he got really interested in the whole comic book thing, video games, Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons and all of that. So his mother was a schizophrenic and the mother abandoned the family. So I'm assuming he was raised by 
his father. The sister explained more about their background, but I forgot if they were raised by one of their parents or not. But their parents have separated and he tells Lindy that um, as painful as it was to have his parents separate and of course his mother abandoning the family, he understood why his parents made the decisions that they made. And he respected them for giving it, you know, the best chance they could give it but it just didn't work out at the end and he kind of like doesn't have any hard feelings towards that um lindy also talks about her own parents divorcing when she was in the eighth grade and how she kind of envied her friends who did have an intact family and so she says she wants to break the cycle and so for her she also has that to motivate her to stay within this marriage because she doesn't want to go through what her parents went through and they have a conversation about sex. So Lindy gives us very long explanation because she's a talker. She gives this extremely long explanation of why um, she's waiting. And, you know, it's all based in religion and not necessarily like she's choosing to use religion as an excuse. It's more so she's been so indoctrinated with this religion and what you should and shouldn't do that she can't shake it. You know, it's just like in, ingrained in her to believe that you have to wait until you're married and you have to wait until it's the right time. And, you know, um, the whole thing about preaching abstinence has been so ingrained in her that it's not like she's like consciously following it. It's almost like subconsciously, you know, she's, um, um, following these, um, religious, uh, beliefs that, you know, you have to be absent, you have to be absent, you have to be abstinent. Now I'm assuming that her religion is, I think a seventh day Adventist. You have to be um, abstinent before you're married, but you're actually married now. So I don't know if she's kind of like grasped the idea that you're a married woman. This is your husband and this is what married people do. So you kind of have to shake off that whole abstinence thing. But she, I don't know if she's using the religion as an excuse to not, you know, um, hop into bed with him or if she's really believing what she's saying. But, you know, you're married. I guess she doesn't want to get her feelings involved too much. And with women in general, not all women, but in general, when a woman makes that decision, especially with the guy that she really, really, really likes and has feelings for, once you make that decision to lay down with them, um, it gets even more complicated. Okay. It gets even more complicated. And now you're kind of like more involved and you've got more feelings involved now that you have given him your body. So I think that's what she's trying to avoid because if he's kind of iffy about how he feels about her, then of course she's not going to want to, you know, give him her body because she doesn't know if he's going to even stick around. And so what would be the point? So it kind of makes sense in that aspect. But Miguel wants to tap into that. He says, I need to, you know, I need to have sex with you because I have to like express, this is how I express my feelings, express my love. Miguel, that sounds like something that, you know, uh, a senior in high school would say to a freshman in high school. <laughs> to get them to go to bed with them. So, um, come better, come better than that, Miguel, next time around. Let's use something better than that. Moving on to Alexis and Justin. So they go, Alexis and Justin, Alexis to me, I've already said this. She looks just like Oprah to me. She looks like a younger version of Oprah. Like she's Oprah's daughter or Oprah. Yeah. She looks like Oprah's daughter to me. She looks just like Oprah, especially around the eyes. So Alexis and Justin, they go horseback riding. And um, Alexis says that she can tell that Justin is falling in love with her just by how he looks at her. Now, Justin to me seems like someone who falls in love very easily and very quickly. And I think also, and this is no disrespect to Alexis, but it seems like it doesn't matter <laughs> who the person is. If he considers you his girlfriend or his partner, Justin starts falling in love with you. Like it's so easy for him to fall for someone. And I think this is the reason why his brother was so uber concerned about him doing this process, doing this exper experiment, because it's kind of like... My brother falls for women very, very easily. It doesn't take much for him to fall deeply in love. And then he's so deep in it that we can't pull him back out again. You know, he falls so far and so deep that when it doesn't work out, he's lost. We can't find him. We don't know where he is. We cannot pull him out to help him. And I think that's why the brother was so concerned. So um, 
Alexa says that she's got, well, she doesn't say this, but she does have her walls up. She says she doesn't want someone else to have so much control over her feelings or her emotions. She said that once you love someone and they make you happy, if they have the power to make you happy, they also have the power to make you sad. And I'm thinking, what a way to live. Like you're always constantly avoiding love, avoiding, you know, um, expressing your feelings or realizing what you're feeling and being honest about your feelings because you're so afraid of getting hurt. So like, why are you even on the show? Why don't you just stay single? Why are you on a show where you have to get married to someone and there's a very high chance that you can be falling for them? But then you have these walls up and you're so guarded. Like, why are you even here? So at dinner, um, Alexa says that, you know, to show vulnerability, it shows that you have the if you show vulnerability, you show that you have the ability to be hurt. You know, you express how you feel about someone, that person's going to come and probably, you know, take advantage of that. And they're going to end up hurting you. So she's very, 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 very guarded. So Alexis um, tells him that, you know, you're made for me and I need you. And I can't believe she said that because up until then she was talking about, um, I don't want anyone to have the power to make me happy because they're going to make me sad. I don't want anyone to take control of my feelings. I have to be in control of my own feelings. And then she tells him, you make me, ha um, she says, you you're made for me and I need you. So I'm like, okay, that's like expressing vulnerability. That's expressing emotion. And so, um, when, when she said that, I was like, oh my God, it's going to be all over for Jesse. It's going to be so over for him because now he knows that she does have feelings for him and he's got feelings for her. He's done. So he tells her that he wants to have kids. He sees himself with her for the rest of his life. And, you know, he's in it deep. Justin, our boy, Justin is in it deep, 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 deep. He's at the bottom of the ocean. So he said that he loved her. He tells her, I love her. And he tells her that he's in love with her. Not just, I love you. I am in love with you. Okay. He's got a bad for Alexis. But then something tells me y'all that Justin's the kind of guy that he falls easily for anybody. You know, he could be standing in line and at a, at the grocery store and the clerk could be like, Oh, you got such pretty teeth or something like that. And he's in love. Next thing you know, he's at the damn store every single day trying to get into her line. So he just seems like someone like he just falls very easily for someone. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong because I was wrong about him having low T. So he tells her that Alexis has created a comfort zone for him where he feels, um, comfortable to be who he is. He feels comfortable being himself. He doesn't have to put on an act. Um, he can be, he can just be who he is, say whatever, do whatever. He doesn't have to worry about being judged or criticized or looked at funny. And she just makes him feel very, very comfortable. And Justin asked her, can you see yourself falling in love with me? And Alexis was like, you know, she was like, okay, this is too much. This is just too much now. All of the sharing of feelings and you telling me that you love me. Okay, I got to pump the brakes because it's just too much, too much, too much. So she couldn't really answer that question. Um, she says that she needs to be sure before she can say that she loves him. She needs to be absolutely 100% sure of how she feels about him before she can say those words. Justin then starts to cry. Okay. He starts crying. Um, he genuinely wants to spend the rest of his life with her. And um, he says to her that he fell in love with her at the altar. As soon as he saw her for the very first time, he says, I don't know if you believe in love at first sight, but what I'm experiencing was love at first sight with you. I was in love with you the moment that I saw you. It is over for Justin. And if Alexis is not even one eighth to where he's at, as far as feelings and love, then she needs to walk away now. She needs to walk away from this man now because it seems like maybe the more they stay together, the feelings are just going to become stronger. And then it's going to be a lot of pressure for her to feel the same way or risk breaking this man's heart. Justin is just absolutely reckless. He is so reckless with his feelings. And I'm, and I'm thinking it all makes sense now why the brother was so adamant, so adamant about Justin not doing the show. <laughs>
<laughs> because the brother knew he knew that my baby brother is going to go on this television show and make a damn fool of himself by falling head over heels, goofy in love with some strange woman. The brother knew it and the brother was trying to save him and protect him. But Justin was like, get the hell off me. I'm going on this show. I'm going to get me a wife. And um, he is running amok on these Married at First Sight streets. He is like just wilding out on Married at First Sight, going crazy, buck wild, because you cannot pull Justin back. The way he is about Alexis, you cannot pull him back. It, it's like, she's like a drug to him. He is absolutely addicted to Alexis. And you, he needs to go into some deep, intense, inpatient therapy treatment to get over her Alexis. So he starts crying because he's just so overwhelmed with love um, for her. He can't control himself. And um, he says that he is convinced that Alexis is also in love with him because he can tell by her actions. He says, you don't even have to say the words. You don't even have to say you love me because I know you do. Wow, he has created his own reality. He's going to live in that reality because it's very comfortable for him. It's warm and cozy to live in this reality that Alexis is just as much in love with him as he is with her. That is Alexis and Justin. Let's pray for him. Moving on to Mitch and Kristen. So Mitch and Kristen, um, they decide to go uh, paddle boarding. Uh, stand up paddle boarding and um, they do that. They have fun. They come back and sit down and they talk about some stuff. They're having a conversation and come to find out that the questionnaire that um, married at first sight gives them, it's a very long, intense questionnaire. And it took Kristen said it took her days to complete it. So she tells him that one of her non-negotiables is that she wanted someone who was very passionate about his career. Now, Kristen is only saying this because she's trying to connect with him. She sees as there's some distance between them, that there's something not clicking between them. So she's trying to find a way to connect with him. So maybe if they can connect, he can be more attracted to her. So I felt like she said that the whole thing about, I wanted someone to be passionate about their career because she sees how passionate he is about the environment. And so she's trying to use that as a tool to lure him in, to be like, oh, I really admire how passionate you are about the environment because that's one of the things that I wanted in, in my partner. And so Mitch just, uh, tells her that, that, yeah, um, I'm glad that you appreciate that because I didn't want to be with someone who kind of saw me as this crazy environmentalist militant. So she she also appreciates him pointing out to her all the different ways that she can save the planet. So once again, she's laying it on really, really thick. She understands that talking about the environment, that's his thing. That's where his heart is. And so she's trying to meet him there by talking about the environment. And Kristen thinks that intimacy is, she tells us that the intimacy is moving a whole hell of a lot slower than what she would like. And um, she tells them that, you know, things are kind of moving slowly with us, but we need to be headed in the right direction. You know, direction being that bed over there. That's where we need to be headed. And so she's like, I want you to pinky promise me that we're going to continue to move in the right direction. And so they pinky promise. And then one of them says that the pinky promise is their version. I think she said it. She says that the pinky promise is our version of a kiss. And he just laughs it off because he knows that it's true. He'd rather pinky promise than kiss her. So then Later on, we see him on the phone with his brother and he's telling his brother his concerns. He says that he's not feeling any kind of physical attraction towards her. Um, it doesn't take anything away from her appearance wise. He says she's very beautiful. She's, you know, whatever, whatever. She's very attractive. It just not really his type. And the brother tells him, look, you're kind of jumping the gun here. You need to just see it through all the way to the end because things can change later. You know, don't give up on it now. And what I have to say about this is I don't understand why some of the people, I was going to say contestants, some of the people on this show feel this need that they have to have this very strong physical chemistry on the very first day of meeting one another. And like they kind of give up if it's not there. And once they've 
realized, okay, I'm not really feeling this person. I'm not really attracted to them. They let that dictate the rest of the experience and the rest of the relationship. Instead of just trying to find something that you do like about that person and concentrating on that. And then just living in the moment instead of worrying so much about, am I ever going to feel attracted? Am I ever going to feel that spark? Did I feel it today? Wait a minute. Am I feeling it right now? Oh no, that's it. That's just indigestion. You know, instead of being so worried about, I need to feel the spark. I have to feel the attraction. I have to feel the chemistry. Just put that to the side and just enjoy the person. Even if, and I want to say, even if you have to enjoy them as a friend, but not necessarily as a friend, but just to enjoy them as a human being, you know, do the things that y'all are supposed to do, do the exercise that y'all are supposed to have, create that connection, create that bond. And, you know, just let the other stuff just kind of just, whether it's, it's either going to happen or it's not. Okay. It's either going to happen or it's not, it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. But in the meantime, enjoy this experience for what it is. Um, if anything, y'all might even just end up being really good friends at the end of it all. And, and I know like, you know, for, I guess if he feels like if there is an attraction there, then, you know, they're not going to want to be intimate with one another, or he's not going to want to be intimate with her because there's no attraction there. Well, <sighs> I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's ways around that for guys like there is for, for, for girls, but we do see that there was a way around it with Mitch later on, but I just don't want Mitch to be so, to put so much pressure on himself about this physical attraction. Then he puts the pressure on her. Now they're both extremely stressed out. Now there's this huge thing, this huge big O attention ball between them that they can never really get around because it's all about, Oh my God, I didn't feel this. I didn't feel that as soon as I saw you. But sometimes that can grow when you realize, wow, this person's a really cool person. And there could be that moment when all of a sudden it just strikes you out of nowhere. Wait a minute you know, I'm really feeling something for this person. So just relax and enjoy the experience. But of course, they don't want to do that. They want to be stressed the hell out. So um, Mitch says that he doesn't want to pretend. He tells his brother, I don't want to pretend about what I'm feeling. He wants to be open and honest with her. He's he's that once again, he's that guy. And um, I think the family had said that at the wedding, um, in the vows or whatever, um, in the cheat sheets that the that they say at the altar. I think they said that he was honest to a fault. Like he's one of those people that he just believes he has to be honest all the time. He has to like tell you exactly what he's thinking, exactly what he's feeling. And sometimes that can severely backfire. So he says that he feels like, you know, I have to tell her exactly how I feel. And he goes, but I'm going through this. I'm going through all this stress, but I don't even know how she really feels about me. So he doesn't even know how she feels about him. And he's already stressing himself out about how he feels about her. So then they have dinner. Kristen, in her little confessional, she says that she needs more than a pinky promise. You know, she wants to get some action going. And I don't know why she's in a rush to do this. You know, like why she's so pressured and stressed out about this. Um, Like, I just don't get it. What I would tell her exactly what I'm telling Mitch. Don't worry about that. Just let it happen naturally. I mean, you're a grown woman. You know what it means when that occurs and it's supposed to occur naturally because both of you want it because both of you are ready for it. You know when the time is right. So don't force a situation because if she puts that pressure on him and he, and he falls into that pressure, then she's going to wonder, well, was it because I, I made him do it? Was it because I pressured him into it or because he really wanted to? So just relax, enjoy Puerto Vallarta, enjoy this wonderful experience and stop concentrating on the negative. So she wants some type of reassurance, you know, that he is interested in her. Mitch tells her that, so they're sitting down having dinner and Mitch tells her that he does appreciate that she's willing to take things slowly and that she's willing to kind of not rush into anything. And then as soon as he said that, Kristen says, okay, that's great, but I'd be more comfortable if we were advancing physically. So as soon as he said, I'm glad that you're allowing things just to kind of go slowly, kind of progress at at its own pace. She comes back and says, okay, yeah, whatever, but I need things to move along a little bit more quickly in the physical department. Like, did you just not hear what he said? And so Mitch says, well, I wish that I, I wish I felt at this point, 
I wish I felt that at this point, but I don't feel that right now. He says, I'm not feeling any type of physical attraction to you. He tells her this. And it's like, girl, you set yourself up for that. Because when Midge said, hey, I'm glad that we're going to let this go. We're going to take things a little bit more slowly. When he said that, she should have just accepted that and then change the conversation to something, anything else. Just say, okay, yeah, I'm glad that we're going to take it slowly too, because, you know, we're still strangers. So yeah, let's kind of just go, you know, st you know, step by step. There's no need to rush anything. And then talk about the wine, talk about the beer, talk about the food, talk about the weather, talk about this wonderful vacation that you're on. But no, she turned it into something that it was a lot deeper and it was a lot uglier than what it needed to be. So then he just had to, you know, honest Mitch, he just had to tell her the truth and says, look, I'm just not really feeling you. I'm not that attracted to you. And I don't know how she could have sat there and take and take that. I don't know if it was the wine that kept her sitting there or what, because I would have been so broken hearted. If somebody told me that I would have gotten up and left. So Mitch is still, he says he's still in it. He's still committed and he still wants to see it through. So he's not throwing in the towel by any means. He's still in this. So Kristen then gets emotional and she says that she's going to remain hopeful. In her confessional, though, she says that she's very confused because his actions are showing that he is attracted to her. But she didn't expound on that. So she didn't tell us why she said that. So then after that, later on in the night, they're um, by the pool. They're having tequila shots. So everybody's feeling very warm and really nice inside. You know, it's, it's a beautiful night, clear sky. The stars are twinkling. The tequila is nice. And and they're, you know, half naked and blah, blah, blah. So the mood is right, right? So Kristen says she's very confused. She tells him, no, she tells us, I think, that she was very confused because one minute he's telling her he's not attracted to her. But then the next minute, you know, he's taking tequila shots with me under the moon. And I didn't understand what she meant because how was one minute different from the next? He's still not attracted to you. I mean, I don't understand. What did you see that we didn't see, Kristen? Like, what, what are you talking about? And so then... She's hoping that um, he sees in her what she sees in herself. So then later on, they have a conversation. Oh, so later on, um, this is after the group gets together. So there's a time when everybody gets together. By the way, Morgan and Ben, let's get them out the way. Morgan and Ben. Oh, my goodness. Morgan and Ben, they get married. whoop de doo And... Um, at the wedding, she talks to his mom. His mom is like, when are you going to have kids? I'm waiting for grandkids. And, you know, Morgan doesn't really want children. Even her bridesmaids tell Ben that, you know, Morgan really doesn't really care about having kids. So they're not on the same page with that. And I think Ben would go along with Morgan, but he's such a mama's boy. His mom has such a grip on him and such control over his life that he feels like he has to have children, not for himself, but for his mother, because that's what his mother wants. That's what I'm getting. And so they talk about, so, okay. So then there's that whole issue with the children. Um, not really much happened. Um, those are the whole kids thing. When I see Morgan and Ben together, they seem more like buddies than a married couple. Like I don't see, they laugh a lot together. They play a lot together. They get along really well. I just don't see any romantic chemistry between them. I really don't. So they're able to join everybody else at the, at the honeymoon. So we're all on the same track now. So all, they all get together on a boat or a yacht or whatever it was. And, um, we come to find out, I'm not sure exactly when this was revealed to us, but at some point we find out that Kristen and Mitch had a moment. So the tequila was flowing. They're feeling nice and warm and toasty. And they go back into the room and um, he made a move on her. And I don't think that they consummated their marriage, but I think that they were probably, they kissed or something. And so she tells him that, um, she wants him to compliment her more. So she basically lays out exactly what she wants out of him because of that moment that they had, you know, when he felt that spark, he felt that attraction for her after the tequila and he wanted to jump her bones. I guess she felt like now she was back in control of the situation. So now she's going to lay out exactly what she's expecting from him. Um, she says that she wants him to compliment her more. 
And I think the reason why she said this was because um, on the day of their wedding, he didn't compliment her at all. I don't think he complimented her at all. Um, and we're used to the groom saying something very complimentary to the bride. He didn't say anything at all to her. Kristen wants to make sure that they're uh, headed in the right direction. And we know where that direction is, the bedroom. And she says, she tells him this. And I could not believe she said this. She said that I will definitely be asking for a divorce if they're not... Um, if they haven't been intimate by the time they get to decision day, that she's going to be asking for a divorce if she's uh, not getting what she wants out of him. She's extremely forceful. She's putting a lot of pressure on him. And I'm thinking to myself, is it too late to, to do like a little switcheroo? Maybe put Kristen with Mitch. I mean, Kristen with um, Miguel. Maybe that'd be a better match. Kristen and Miguel. <laughs> and then uh, Lindy and Mitch. Because she's hardcore about her religion. He's hardcore about the environment. So, yeah, because Miguel is ready to go. He's locked and loaded. And Kristen is ready to go. She's locked and loaded. So what about if they got together? Maybe that would be a better match. But, y'all, for her to tell him, if we're not slanging and banging by the time we get to decision day, I'm going to ask for a divorce. Girl, you're putting emphasis on the wrong damn thing. That can happen. That whole that can happen with him and you can still have a horrible marriage. He can give you all the loving you want and you can still have a horrible marriage. Okay? You can get that from a stranger off the street. We need to make a real true connection. It's not about that. And I think the reason why Chris is putting a lot of um emphasis on intimacy, I think that's how she validates herself is if a man wants to sleep with her. That's how she validates herself as a woman. That's what I think. And that's why she's doing this. Anyway, this review has gone on way too long. I don't think I have anything else to say. They went on their couple's excursion. Oh, by the way, on the couple's excursion, um, when they were all together on the boat, um, once again, Alexis, because Ben and Morgan, you know, they're, they've just arrived. And so they're all getting, getting to know them. Um, Alexis tells Morgan that Justin is celibate. Like once again, she spills the tea on him. And I'm like, girl, does he, does he give you permission to talk about such things? But he's so in love with Alexis. She could have called him anything but a child of God. And he wouldn't care because he's so in love with her. Um, the changing of the last names. Let's talk about that. Stasha changed her last name to um, Nate's last name. And she said the reason why she did it was because she doesn't have any attachment to her last name, her father's last name, because she doesn't know who her father is. So she couldn't wait to get rid of that name. And this was the perfect way to get rid of it. Girl, you could have done a name change a long time ago. It ain't that hard to change your name. You could have taken on your own, made up a name, taken on your mom's uh, name. You could have, girl, please. I think she does it she I think Stasha she's this wants to come across as this boss lady taking care of business but no she's one of those women that's just like really eager to please very eager to please a man I think that's why she changed her last name to make Nate happy because she could have been gotten rid of her father's name if that was the issue um so she gives this long story about I'm not really I don't know who my father is and my stepdad I really wasn't close to him and um you know this whole father daughter complex thing but she changed her name to make him happy um Justin tells the guys that he already told Alexis that he loved her the guys were like hey if that's what you feel then that's what you feel Alexis tells the girls that she wanted to run when Justin told her that he loved her um, Nate believes that they're going to consummate the marriage before the honeymoon is over. I believe that too. I agree with you, Nate. I think that's going to happen for sure. Um, yeah, that's the end of my review. <sighs> so far, so good. I'm enjoying it. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. On your way out, please don't forget to rate the video. And if you like this content, please subscribe. And I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.